Hello everyone, good evening and welcome to Bangalore International Center. BIC is an inclusive and neutral platform for informed conversation, exchange of ideas, arts and culture. This evening's program is Genealogy of the Constitution, where Sudeepta Kaviraj delivers the MK Nambiar Annual Lecture. Before I hand it over to our collaborators, NLSIU, to take over the rest of the program, a few house rules. I request all of you to either switch off your mobile phones or put them on silent. Kindly refrain from flash photography or videography. Can everyone please take a moment to do that? Okay, thank you so much. Now over to Vice Chancellor Sudhir Krishnaswamy. Good evening and welcome to the first MK Nambiar annual lecture to be delivered by Professor Sudipta Kaviraj, the Professor of Middle Eastern, South Asian and African Studies at Columbia University, New York. Melod Krishnan Nambiar is a renowned constitutional lawyer who began practicing first at the Mangalore District Courts and then at the Madras High Court and the Supreme Court of India. In 1950, in A.K. Gopalan v. State of Madras, M.K. Nambiar argued that the phrase procedure established by law in Article 21 should be read not literally but structurally to require a just, fair, and reasonable procedure prior to, re to preventive detention by the state. He also argued that Articles 19 and 21 should be read together and not separately in these matters. He lost both matters, lost both arguments in A.K. Gopalan, but over the next three decades, the Supreme Court reversed its decision and embraced these arguments. In 1967, in Golaknath versus State of Punjab, A.K. Nambiar argued that the amending power of parliament in Article 368 should be read to include implied limitations to preserve the essential features of the Constitution. Once again, he lost in Golaknath, only for the court to embrace this position in Keshnand Bharti in 1973. This historical record confirms the place of M.K. Nambiar among the, the foremost Indian lawyers in post-independence India. So we are delighted that Sri K.K. Gopal till recently the Attorney General of India, endowed a chair on constitutional law in the name of his father, M.K. Nambiar. We gather here today to acknowledge and celebrate this legacy through the first M.K. Nambiar lecture uh, to be delivered by Professor Sudipta Kaviraj. So may I now invite Professor Sudipta Kaviraj and P Professor Rinku Lamba to take the stage and begin this evening's lecture. Good evening, everyone. A very warm welcome from my side too, particularly to Professor Sudipto Kaviraj, whom it will be such a pleasure to introduce this evening. Sudipto Kaviraj serves as professor in Columbia University in its Department of Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies. He is a specialist in intellectual history and Indian politics. He works on two fields of intellectual history which are Indian social and political thought in the 19th and 20th centuries, and modern Indian literature and cultural production. His other areas of interest and research include the historical sociology of the Indian state and some aspects of Western social theory. He received his PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Prior to joining Columbia University, he taught at the Department of Political Studies at SOAS in the University of London. He also taught at the Center for Political Studies in Jawaharlal Nehru University before that. 
and has been an Agatha Harrison Fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford. He is a member of the Subaltern Studies Collective. His books include, and I'm going chronologically, The Unhappy Consciousness, which was about Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyay and the formation of nationalist discourse in India, on the imaginary institution of India, co-edited work with Sunil Khilnani on civil society, history and, possible, history and possibilities, as well as an edited volume called Politics in India. He, is, he has been writing a lot of exciting essays about which I'd like to say something in the next minutes, which are, which are not quite the same as the material that's covered in the books that I just named. So to my mind, Professor Kaviraj's corpus of work is highly attractive because it allows reckoning with some very intriguing and urgent questions. If the question at hand is whether the modern is the same as the Western and whether the modern Western is fraught with the colonial, then what would it mean to think of an Indian modernity? What are the sources of the Indian self? What can it mean to be modern Indian? Is the modern the same everywhere? In what sense, if at all, can modern constitutions be properly called modern without being understood as the same? Professor Kaviraj's work, and especially his work since the early 2000s, has shown the coherence of inquiring about and unraveling the modern in India. And he demonstrates how that can be done without rejecting or deifying the corpus of thought that's usually associated with the modern West. So what matters really in his work, it seems, is a, the place of history, which is sometimes also referred to as initial conditions. So history or initial or and initial conditions are quite important in understanding the present which we also need to understand the past then. If the past is the base on which the new is planted, there is already an initial script, as he puts it, in place when social change caused by different historical forces is afoot. The new can be translated through the old, and the old can either get reshaped for entirely new purposes or just drop off. The modern frequently can also take form in this way by scripting itself over earlier scripts. And those scripts, Kaviraj reminds us, may well shape the way newer scripts take shape. But how do we discern these moves and translations across scripts? And what tools do we have to discern what is extant and what was there before? What theoretical tools do we have? And this is where I think his work has been very exciting to study the institution of the state, to study something like secularity on the subcontinent from the older, earlier period in India to the modern, as well as answering questions like, why is it that the Indian modern has deferred the process of disenchantment, something which Max Weber thought would ineluctably accompany the modern anywhere? So the methodology required for the use of tools in ways that are neither going to produce derivative discourse, nor waste any resource that may come from theoretical thinking elsewhere, has resulted in, in, in lots of interesting tools that he has suggested for us with respect to how to do history about institutions in the present. And I want to say something about his work on the state as an example, and I'll stop there and hand it over to him after that. So he tells us in, in, a, in a lovely essay about the state in India in its pre-modern and modern avatars, that there is the first question of how do you study something that's supposed to be the state now, but which might have been something else many centuries ago? It's, can we use a Weberian definition of the modern state to understand what we might first call pre-modern forms of state power? Right? Is, it, is, it, is it coherent to do that? And I want to quote what he says there, a longish quote, but I think very illustrative of the, the very sharp way through which he makes his arguments in these domains. He says, when he's talking about how to understand state power in India in the modern and the pre-modern period, that although we generally tend to speak about the pre-modern and the modern state, this way of speaking has a major conceptual shortcoming. I'm continuing to quote now. 
it implicitly contains an unavoidable suggestion that we are talking about two historically different versions of the same object, though this precisely is to be seen as a problem. So that we don't just think that the modern state and the pre-modern state are two historically versions of the same object. We cannot use some dominant definition of what the state is to study older formations, and we still need some tools to figure what the state might look like in a generic way to make comparison coherent. So he says then, let's work with something like the following. If, the, and I'm quoting again, if the state designates any coherent, distinct organization of power such that it identifies a group of people and an institutional structure that lays down the rules which members of a society must follow, then that understanding can perform the conceptual function of that generic category, end of quote. So thank you for bearing with me through these quotations and through this somewhat detailed delineation of an example of what he does when he's comparing the pre-modern and the modern. There are ramifications for Western social and political theory. There are ramifications for the way we do the history of Indian political thought and understand the theoretical insights that underpin them. And I think we're really fortunate that we have him here this evening to speak with us about the genealogy of the Constitution. Thank you, Professor Kaviraj, for being here with us. And I hand it over to you now. Hand it over to you now. You uh, <coughs> give me a signal when I have 10 minutes left. Okay, I'll come up to this. Yeah, I'll do okay. that. <coughs> so thanks very much for uh, the great honor that you have given me by asking me to deliver the K MK Nambiar Memorial Lecture. Uh, named after a juridical figure that Soli Sorabji calls one of our greatest constitutional lawyers. And uh, Sudhir told us his, uh, about his involvement in the A.K. Gopalan co case, <clears throat> then the Goloknath case and the Keshavanand Bharati case. And one can surmise, at least that's the suggestion that I got from uh, Soli Sorabji's note on him, that we owe the phrase a basic structure of the Constitution in our legal thinking to him. Now, I'm not a lawyer, and so in a certain sense it's misplaced to have me as the first person to deliver the lecture. But I have great admiration for lawyers from the point of view of political theory. Because I think, you know, political theory, if you do it seriously, <coughs> is an activity which tends to distance you from political, the world of political action, precisely because you, know, you want to hold the world of political action off at a distance so that you can set up a kind of critical relationship between you and what you're observing. Lawyers, I think, are not like that. In fact, practitioners of legal thought, because it's also very serious thought about the political and <coughs> the political and uh, you know, the juridical at the same time. It is, I think, at much more at the intersection of theory and urgent questions of social science. So although I'm not a lawyer, I'm speaking here as essentially a student of political theory, but from a deep admiration for the profession that you, um, the profession that you have. <coughs> so I have titled uh, the lecture today the genealogy of the Indian Constitution. Uh, not to talk about the Constitution legally, but to talk about the set of ideas, larger theoretical ideas on which I think the Indian Constitution is based. <coughs> and um, I want to argue um, that the Indian Constitution is actually an extremely innovative document in terms of political thought particularly the political thought that has gone behind it. So this is what I'm going to uh, argue. So genealogy means a family tree, the long complex of affiliations. 
again in a literal sense of an individual, I fear that the present discussion on the Constitution in our country is sometimes ascribing to our Constitution a completely er erroneous genealogy. So this thing that the Indian Constitution is driven by ideas of Western providence. I want to suggest at the end of this lecture that the Indian Constitution was a remarkable achievement of anti-colonial thought in 1946, when there was not a single decolonized state in the world. The first act of political decolonization from Western imperial power in India was also a remarkable act of intellectual insubordination and originality. But this goes contrary to a view, which I'll take up now, Contrary to the view, advanced often by authors of great distinction, that Indian political thought, the tradition of analytical reflection that lay behind the juridical structure of the Constitution, was marked either by poverty or by derivativeness. Those of you who have done Indian political thought would recognize these two uh, terms. The first term, the first term is taken from um, a very well-known paper by Professor Bhikkhu Parikh, uh, The Poverty of Indian Political Thought. And the second term, derivativeness, is taken from, again, the title of a very distinguished and very important book by my friend and colleague, uh, Partho Chatterjee, <coughs> Nationalist Thought and the, Polit and the Colonial World. And the subtitle of that uh, book is A Derivative Discourse, but with a question mark. Now, there are differences between um, the two positions. Reflecting the differences in the political theory, that's actually held by the two authors. Uh, Professor Parikh is more of a liberal political theorist, and his objections and criticisms are <coughs> more about academic political theory in India. So to be fair to the two people that I'm taking up uh, for criticizing, not criticizing really, but it's um, to uh, clarify and amplify the question that we are trying to discuss. <coughs> uh, Professor Pardik's objection is essentially with academic political theory. And he's not making this claim against the great tradition of nationalistic political thought, which is essentially 19th and 20th century. In Partho's case, the uh, criticism is different. Um, he has an extraordinarily important chapter in the book, which is called The Thematic and the Problem Problematic, in which I think Partho touched on something which is very central to my argument today. <clears throat> but after making that point, Partho actually takes a different direction and uh, follows that rather than this point. The remarkable thing in that chapter is that he says that when we look at Indian nationalist political thought, we find that on the narrow question of political sovereignty, uh, the, the, the subjection of India to the political sovereignty of the British Empire, on this, all nationalist thinkers are very sharply critical of the West. And there's no, uh, there's no hesitancy about the rejection and de denial of that sovereignty. But if you look at their mode of thinking slightly more widely and a bit more closely, then you find that the modes of thinking that they're employing in making this critique of Europe actually depends very, very heavily on modes of thought which they have derived <coughs> from Europe itself. So this is, uh, you know, this is the paradox that he highlights in that chapter. And I think while the rest of his book went into a discussion of three thinkers, uh, Bunkim Chatterjee, um, Gandhi and Nehru. Uh, I think to some extent, you know, Partho does not pursue that question very much further in that book or in his later work. I want to take it up, and um, before I do that, I want to make two theoretical points very quickly. <coughs> 
No, this question of adopting a particular mode of thought and thinking with it, I think generally it seems to be plausible, but I think we need to think a little more closely about it. I think any f mode of thought, whether it is a doctrine <coughs> or a philosophical position or anything like that, I think is with elaboration, it takes on the character of something which is like an alphabet. Alphabet in the sense that the English alphabet has just 26 characters. But everything that has ever been written in the English language are the products of a combination and recombination of all those 26 characters. And I think forms of thought are a bit like that. And you will see why I'm making this point now. Because I'm going to argue that one can take an alphabet and by using alphabet for different types of purposes, it can take that mode of thought in a different kind of direction. I also want to make a simple distinction between, <coughs> and you shall see later why I'm making this point. It's a distinction between a language in which thinking is done and the content of thought that is produced. So uh, to give you a simple example, suppose we take something like Marxism. Uh, it has a particular language which uh, identifies somebody working in the Marxist tradition. But if you look at Stalin, you say that you know, he uses the alphabet of Marxist thought to approach definitions of um, conclusions of one kind. And if you look at Gramsci, by contrast, you'll see that he uses this, not the same elements of the alphabet, but different elements of the same alphabet to arrive at conclusions which are very different. So I want you to keep in mind this distinction between the language and the content of the thought, because at the end, I would make a point about why this creates a problem for us. So I'm going to argue against <coughs> both these readings, that Indian political thought is unoriginal and Indian political thought is not innovative, that Indian thought is actually very innovative, if we, want, if we can do two things, if we can look closely at the ideas which are being presented, and if we also learn to separate in a certain sense the language in which the thinking is being done and the content of the thought uh, that is being produced. You'll see in a moment why I'm saying that about the question of the nation and the nation state. I want to give you three examples. Probably because of time, I would be able to do only two. But I'll mention those examples because you know, this is something that we all think about and I would in invite you to think about the third example as well. The first example is from Tagore, <coughs> but about the question of secularism, religion, science, and secularism. The second argument on which I would spend most of my time would be about the question about developing an idea uh, that I would call the idea of a non-nation state. You know, a state which is a political community, but whose structure is profoundly different, in some ways oppositional to the European idea of the modern nation state. So that's why I rather provocatively uh, call it the idea of the non-nation state, the construction of a non-nation state. The third idea that I uh, thought about more recently was uh, some of the comments that Ambedkar makes about religion and society and the usefulness of Buddhism. That when we think about our own tradition, uh, ancient Indian tradition, ancient Indian tradition is not solidly Hindu. The ancient Indian tradition is also equally, if you look at the ancient times, it's also equally powerfully Buddhist. And there's a lot of tension between the Hindu and the Buddhist tradition generally. And also inside, there's a lot of variation inside the Hindu tradition, which I think Ambedkar sometimes underestimates. Anyway, so let me turn to the arguments now. Now, Tagore is a poet. First, the argument about from Tagore. Tagore is a poet, but he's dealing with what I think is the most significant question, one of the most significant questions of modernity. That is, if we accept, uh, because modernity is defined by the development of modern science, if we accept the scientific picture of the world, that the picture that modern science actually gives us about the nature of the world, about causality, you know, why things happen in, in the world the way they do, etc. What happens to our belief in God? What happens to our belief in religion? It's absolutely central 
to <coughs> the question of religion, modernity, and secularity. To give you an illustration, uh, just to make the point that uh, he's not touching on something tangentially, which is not very important for uh, philosophical discussion. This question, what do I do if I accept the picture of the world that science gives us um, in believing in God? Uh, this is a question which is central, let us say, to the world, uh, work of a very, very well-known German theologian, Rudolf uh, Bultmann, uh, who was a student of Heidegger and who was one of the leading theologians discussing this question. And we can immediately, you know, whether you're a Christian or not, whether you're an atheist or not, no one can deny that in the modern world, if you think about it, there can be no other question which is more important than this, that if I accept the picture of science, can I believe in God? In Bultmann's question, case, he says, can I believe in the resurrection? Uh, that's his, uh, his question. So I personally feel that you know, Tagore has a very interesting dissenting uh, position on this. If you read Tagore's poems, particularly some of his songs, which are very, very well known to people who are, who are Bengalis, you will find an argument which I think if you put it in a philosophical form is like this. <coughs> he takes it from the Upanishads. He, he, I think he finds the Upanishads interesting because of the basic proposition that when human beings look at nature, the basic, you know, the basic emotion or the basic response that comes out of a human being is of wonder. That seems clear and sufficient at this point, but it's not, because we have to push further and ask, what, what does wonder mean? And I think Tagore finds the Upanishad interesting because he thinks that the Upanishad means wonder in two different senses. You know, one is wonder at something which is just incom incomparably intricate, complex, difficult to understand, right? It is actually the greatest mechanism that exists, and a mechanism which we simply cannot begin to understand fully. So wonder here means something which is cognitive, it's cognitive wonder. This is one of the most fundamental forms of wonder. At the same time, Tagore thinks that the Upanishad is remarkable because the Upanishad thinks that aesthetic wonder, you know, how beautiful this is, is something which is completely connected to the cognitive wonder. Of course, analytically cognitive wonder and aesthetic wonder are very different. We should not confuse between them. But the interest of the Upanishadic position, which is very old, very archaic, and also very uh, primitive in a certain, not in the bad sense, primitive in the originary sense, um, is interesting because of this. Look at what Tagore does with that <coughs> sense of wonder at the universe. I thought for, for a long time that Tagore's position was something like this. This is a position, however, that I have abandoned now. I thought that Tagore agreed with Weber that with the rise of modern science, that modern science actually reveals to us more and more and more the intricate, complex, you know, uh, illimitable sort of causalities through which nature is constructed. As Weber said, nature is, the universe is disenchanted. The world is disenchanted. That is, it, it ceases to be mysterious. Its mystery is diminished by the understanding of causality. So it actually sets up a kind of obverse relation you know, between the understanding of causality and the experience of uh, aesthetic beauty. Tagore's argument is, I think, I, I thought at that time Tagore was saying that this is true, this is what happens, but it's because of this we need art, because we need to re-enchant the world. Human beings cannot live in a world, can be, cannot be reconciled to a world, which is totally disenchanted and meaningless. So we re-enchant the world, reinvest the world with meaning, and we can do that by art. So in his case, the art was poetry and music. I have changed my mind on this. I think I now feel that Tagore was saying something which was more basic and which is more profoundly radical. <coughs> in one of his songs, this is not just one. I think I can probably give you 20 examples of the same sentiment in his songs. It basically says, <coughs> 
that when I look at the world and I see its infiniteness, you know, I I feel grateful that somehow, you know, I've actually found the space in the middle of that, and my music rises from that. So I think what Tagore is saying is, uh, let me put it in a slightly different, more theoretical way now. Uh, I'll give you uh, an example which I use in teaching. So if you agree with Weber that if you understand causality, it uh, takes away beauty, it takes away aesthetic wonder, uh, you will have something like this. So I like going to the bank of the Hudson River and look at the sunset. I find it very beautiful. I go there every day. My son is a, is a scientist who works on astronomy. So one day I take my son to the Hudson River and I ask him, why is the sun red at this time of the day? And he gives me a full uh, you know, scientific causal account of why this happens. I think what Tagore is suggesting is that if Weber is right, then I would actually lose all interest in going back to the Hudson River the next day because I have understood it causally and it has actually shown it of its meaningfulness, of its beauty in that sense. I don't think that is true. So I tend to agree with Weber, uh, agree with uh, Tagore. And whether you agree with Tagore or not, I think it's very important, that's my major point, very important to see that the point that is being made here is not just, uh, it's not tendential, it is not something which is a very wishy-washy poetic uh, remark about the world. It is something which is a deep, clearly articulable philosophical position. And it is my task as somebody who has been trained to be a student of political thought, you know, to put that idea into this language, right? So this is the first example. <coughs> I now turn to this second question on which I want to spend most of my time. This is the question of how to construct the non-nation. This is also, you can see, uh, directly inspired by Tagore. Tagore gave those three lectures on nationalism. The first one was in Japan. And <coughs> in that lecture at one point, he says that unlike the Europeans, we come from the, the he says, we come from the world of the no-nation. We come from the world of the non-nation, right? So I picked up that slightly awkward word, you know, to, uh, to put this point sharply. <coughs> so, um, I think we can safely argue that one of the central certitudes almost axiomatic certitudes of European political thought is that under conditions of modernity, if you have to have an effective state, the effective state has to have the form, which is the form of the European nation state. It must have clear boundaries. It must have an identifiable people. Interestingly, you know, some of the developments in democratic thought, for instance, the idea of popular sovereignty, it's not the monarch who is the sovereign, but it's the people who are the sovereign, etc. They depend logically on this prior idea of an identifiable people, right? So a people who is homogenous in terms of their religion, their culture, their language, etc., etc., right? And that state is the only possible state under modern conditions. It's important to stress that point. That's the state which is the only possible effective state under modern conditions. You cannot have a state, a political community, which is effective, which is morally justifiable, et cetera, et cetera, under modern conditions, if it does not have that form. Now, <coughs> all Indian political thinkers from the 19th century, they faced both the power of this theoretical elaboration, they were going to colleges where they're con continuously reading European political thought from Hobbes to, uh, Hobbes to Hegel, Marx, etc. And this is the substance in a certain sense you know, of that uh, theoretical tradition. They're also seeing this being played out in history. In fact, they're asking the question, why is it that you know, such a small number of people from such a distant nation was able to colonize a country like ours? And the answer to that is that the prevalence of the nation state. They are organized in a certain way, which we are not. And this is what actually gives them the power. 
So the modern nation state impresses them in, in these two ways, in the world of ideas and also in the world of history. So both these things actually seem to confirm to them the, the presence, I would not say the validity, <coughs> you'll see why, the presence of uh, you know, this kind of theoretical position, which is the central certitude of Western political theory. I think Indian thought develops two traditions of responding to this idea. Uh, one accepts this as fate. One accepts that you know, the logic of modernity is such that if you want a state, if you want that state to be successful, that's the only form in which you can produce the state or construct the state. And so that tradition accepts this as fate, wants to learn it, learn how to do it, and wants to be good at it. You know, somewhat like Japan, I think there's a very similar uh, tradition of thinking and acting in Japan. But that's not the only tradition. And you might be surprised, probably not surprised, uh, at the mention of the two people, I think, who are paradigmatic examples of this. One is Iqbal, and the other one is Savarkar. <coughs> There's another tradition which rejects this as fate and tries slowly, you know, through a new parampara. I'm using the term parampara in the, in the literal sense. It is something, you know, which actually hands the thought from one particular person to another, to another, etc., And I think that is the tradition that we find in Indian political thought on this side, also on the other side, but more on this side. To develop a model of a state, which is a non-nation non state, that is a state which is not like the European nation state. So I'll now give you just the, uh, some major points of this parampara. I personally find this for the first time in the work of somebody called Bhudev Mukhopadhyay. I'm a great admirer of Bhudev on this point. Bhudev is a conservative Hindu, so I obviously do not agree with Bhudev in everything. But this is something on which I think he has something which is really, really valuable. In Bhudev, what I seem to find is, probably some of you might say that I'm actually putting my words into Bhudev's mouth, which is partly true, but this is something that you have to do if you do this kind of political theory. But basically, I think what this tradition says is that there are two ways in which you can think of the political community and what you can base the political community on. The political community must have a base, right? It must have a structural base. Most importantly, it must actually have an affective base, right? And there are two ways in which you can affectively base the political community. The central concept of the first tradition is blood. Blood meaning we come from the same race, we are the same people, etc., etc. And uh, Bhudev is also conscious, this is why I admire him. <coughs> he takes this up and he also reveals how the idea of blood, which is extremely powerful, very, very powerful, it's one of the most powerful, you know, human ideas, it has a very powerful ancient medieval form. It also has an equal powerful modern form. Look at the blood that is being spilt in uh, Gaza, you know, and, uh, and think, of the, think of the idea, or, yeah, think of the idea for which this being, blood is being spilt, and is being spilt for blood. In fact, the great idea on both the sides is blood. Right. <coughs> now, but Budev thinks that it's a very powerful idea, but it also has a very peculiar character. The more you elaborate the idea, the more you extend the idea, it actually becomes weaker, and after some time, it crosses the boundary and becomes fictitious. Right. So if I say that I'm a Hindu, or uh, whatever, any uh, identity of this kind, which is a blood related identity, the further you go, you, know, you will find that you are actually seeing a connection between two people or between different types of people, where the real connection is actually quite weak. It is something that you are imposing you know, through this kind of blood imagination. 
Now, <coughs> so he would say that, for instance, if I say that, you know, I feel a very, very strong unity with somebody who comes from Madras, or who comes from Chennai, sorry. Uh, and uh, so the thing would be that you know, I can uh, feel a strong unity with him, but if I try to base it on blood, you know, this is something which would be immediately suspect, that, you know, what do we share in terms of blood? And the European argument about the nation, nation state, particularly the German state, uh, thinking about the nation, you know, the ethnic thinking of the nation, not the, um, you know, not the more republican uh, understanding of the nation, but the ethnic thinking about the nation is very deeply invested in this. Now, after finding that argument suspect, Bhudev does something which I think is very interesting. He looks for an alternative affective base, you know, for human bonding, which can form the base of the political community. And that connection is the connection of neighborliness, right? Not my brother, right? But my neighbor. That is, not somebody who has been made close to me or next to me, close to me or next to me, but close and next are not this, not identical concepts. I'll, I'll separate them in a moment. So somebody who is placed next to me, you can think of three agencies which has placed him next to me. You can think, if you're a religious person deeply, you can say God has placed him next to me. Uh, he can be a good neighbor, bad neighbor. I might actually hate him or I might love him as my family. It doesn't matter. But God has placed him next to me. You can say that nature has placed him next to me. If you were like me, I would say history has placed him next to me. So whoever has placed him next to me, that is actually the base on which we really develop human bonding, human connections, interdependence, and obligation. And I think that you know, this is one of the fundamental, uh, fundamental separations or conflicts in Indian thought on this central question about the relation between the nation and the state. So the second tradition wants a state under modern conditions of modernity, so it needs to be an effective state, right? But they believe that they should not actually look for a state which is the replication of the European state. I wanted to make a couple of um, slightly tangential remarks because I mentioned uh, Savarkar. Well, let me make a point about Iqbal first. If you read Iqbal, you will see that he's a very good observer of the European nation state. And his basic argument is that if modernity allows an effective state to be only of that form, then it's a terrible fate to be a minority in that state form, right? In that, I think he's absolutely right. But where somebody could disagree with Iqbal was on this question that why should we accept that simply because that has happened in European history and it has not happened spontaneously. The history of the making of the European state is an extraordinarily violent and bloody history. So Europe was not naturally like that. Europe was made that way, you know, through 200 years of essentially state violence. So somebody could say to Iqbal that, you know, why do we take that you know, to be something which is the only possibility under modern conditions. Why don't we at least try to devise a state which has a different kind of form? Now, Iqbal does not take that line. And because of that, my thinking is that if you do not take that line, then of course you will either say that I'm a majority in this state and I'm comfortable and secure. And anybody who is not a majority in that state would actually say that I would leave. I cannot be ever secure in this, in this state, not even with democracy not even with constitutionalism. Nothing can make me secure in this state. We shall be like Jews in European states in the 19th century. And so therefore, what is your solution? You must make a state where you are a majority. And the fallacy of that argument is that if you create a state where you are a majority, there would be people who are not parts of the majority, and they would immediately start thinking like that. So there's a kind of cascading effect of that kind of logic, you know, if you think that way. I find some things interesting in Savarkar. This is not a Savarkar lecture, so uh, I don't want to dwell on that. But uh, I find, for instance, Savarkar's um, treatment of the Buddha uh, 
or let me make a point very generally about Savarkar. I feel that what Savarkar does is that he's so impressed by the logic of modern European thought that he not merely applies it to the present and to the historical period of modernity. He anachronistically applies the notion of the nation you know, into the past. So for him, the whole of history, you know, which the whole of history is not modern history. And if you agree with me that the nation in this uh, narrow sense is an intrinsically modern conception, the nation of the nation state is a modern conception, then you should not think that you will find the nation of the nation state in all parts of history. If you go to ancient India, you go to medieval India, everywhere you go in, in history, you find the nation of the nation state. I think that is one of the most obvious examples of falling into the European trap of making European history universal, or if you use Dipesh's term, for instance, hyperreal, that is uh, something you know, which actually trumps all historical evidence by just its theoretical power. Anyway, and the interesting thing, which is linked to the discussion about Ambedkar, uh, is about Savarkar's treatment of the Buddha. Those of you who have read uh, The Essentials of Hindutva recognize that he actually makes a very intelligent move. <coughs> so he is very unwilling to think, uh, which you can. Uh, Ambedkar sometimes thinks like this. James Mill thinks like that, that Hindus were always a people. And they were weak people. They were disunited people, etc. And they were defeated by others and things like that. He is not comfortable with that. So he actually plays the blame for disunity uh, and uh, ineffectivity in resisting external pressure and things like that to Buddhism. So Buddha's, uh, you know, Buddha's excessive reliance on the principle of nonviolence, which actually disarms you as a people. And so the historical disasters of Hinduism, of the Hindu people as he sees it, uh, it's a very interesting move in which uh, the blame for that disaster is actually displaced onto Buddha and the Buddhists. Uh, and you can make sense of history in a certain sense that way. Anyway, so <coughs> so the dissenting tradition, that is the anti-European tradition of thinking about the nation and the state, rejects the European certitude, which I find you know, I find repeated and accepted in Savarkar and Iqbal kind of argument. The dissenting tradition rejects it in three different ways. First, and uh, I must also, be, this should be clear to you that the dissenting tradition starts from Bhudev in my view. There might be other people who have thought about this this way, but I simply do not know about them because I know only the English literature to some extent, things written in Hindi and of course Bengali. And it's quite possible that somebody writing in Tamil or Telugu or Odia might have actually uttered ideas like this before, which I do not know. <coughs> but that tradition, the parampara, I call it the parampara because the generations are overlapping. So Bhudev, who is an exact contemporary of Bunkim, then Tagore, uh, who is a younger contemporary, uh, Gandhi, uh, slightly younger than Tagore, and then Nehru and others who are much younger. So the, what I'm trying to say is that you know, this is a corpus of ideas which is developed by people like Budev at one point, and then those are developed by uh, the dissenting thinkers later on. But I want to make this point very quickly <coughs> about this rejection. First, it historicizes the nation state form and asserts that this is not a natural condition of humanity, but something peculiar to Europe, and also to a particular time in Europe. Right? So we should not essentialize Europe either. Secondly, it rejects the moral justification of that kind of nation state by showing that it is obviously exclusionary. So all the European, for instance, in European states, uh, in the Westphalian states, uh, if it was a Catholic state and uh, you were a Protestant community, you might be suffered to live, exist somehow, but your 
places of religious observ observance should not actually look like places of religious observance, right? So that kind of thing, that kind of condition of subordination. So it says that it's exclusionary and rejects the, uh, the, its moral justification by saying that. And third, it argues that this is not feasible in India. India in 1946 is not Europe of the period before Westphalia or uh, after Westphalia. So it's a very different history which gives us very different initial conditions <coughs> for starting out to make our state. And so therefore, they ask for a kind of, um, you know, to use uh, Partha Chatterjee's telling phrase uh, for the simple reason that most of the world is not like Europe. Uh, most of the world has a different kind of history. And therefore, they contest the false universality of the form of the nation state. And they believe that these are the two different principles on which you can base the political community of blood and neighborliness and decide with neighborliness. I want to make just a couple of points about neighborliness and then make a few other remarks and finish, right? <coughs> In talking about neighborliness, uh, you sh would have noticed that I put a lot of emphasis on the term next that somebody has been placed next to me. And I just want you to, to see that this idea of who is next, you know, nextness, is something which is potentially an extremely complex and expandable idea. So neighborliness does not necessarily mean, you know, the person who is just next to me, spatially. Um, neighborliness can actually mean that I live in, let's say, uh, Mali, or I live, um, let's say, uh, I live in, an, uh, in Bangladesh and somebody else who lives in Florida, right? We are both threatened by inundation, by the rising sea level. So depending on what the criteria of neighborliness is, you know, neighborliness can actually work in many different directions. It's not just spatial neighborliness. So I have a section in a paper that I'm drafting, at least one person, here has read it, you know, uh, Ram Guha. I sent him a uh, draft of this paper. There is an elaboration of this idea of nextness in, in that. And I think you can see the importance of this idea um, if you look at what is happening in Palestine. You know, because they can look at each other as people who are united by blood and who are also united in a certain sense by this absolutely un, uh, you know, unending enmity. But also at the same time, you know, they're neighbors. They cannot do without each other. You know, whatever one does affects the other. So you can, even in fraught situations like this, I think it's always possible to think of it in terms of these two diff very differently inflected theories of blood and neighborliness. I, I would dispense with the discussion about Ambedkar. I'll mention only a couple of things, just in uh, two sentences. <coughs> I was writing a paper recently for a conference. Initially, I said to the organizer that I don't want to write about Ambedkar because I don't know very much about him. But then I thought that I should read uh, some and then uh, think of writing something. The conference was on Ambedkar's religion. And I found its extraordinary sentence in the uh, paper called Buddha and Karl Marx. Uh, most of you must have read that paper, and you would recall that the paper is written partly in kind of you know, elaborate prose, and parts of it has just sort of staccato sentences, you know, just uh, bullet points kind of thing. You know? And one of these has two very important things that he notices in Buddhism. This is the first sentence. I'm, I think I'm quoting him rightly, short sentence. But I was very surprised by Ambedkar saying that religion is needed in a free society. Just one sentence. Religion is needed in a free society. Why should religion be needed in a free society? And the other thing is that you know the clue to the answer to that question is the use of the word society with a capital S. Remember that Ambedkar continually makes this argument that Hindus have no society. You know, 
uh, there is a society in the obvious sense, obvious minimal sociological sense, but Hindus don't have a society. To show what he means, he capitalizes the S. And uh, you can see influence of Dewey and discussions about democracy and things like that in that. And the second thing, which I found very striking, was that Buddhism is a religion who doesn't have an idea of God and who do, which does not bother about who created the world, for what purpose, etc. So religion is essentially centered on the question what human beings owe to each other. You know, that's the only thing which is the center of the Buddhist religion. And it's only in that sense that religion is needed for a free society and society S with a capital. With, with a capital S. <coughs> now, I won't go into it, it's a fascinating discussion, because I think it actually tells us that when we look at uh, the question, what is our tradition, we usually have a very lazy, one-sided view of it, and we equate the ancient Indian tradition entirely almost, you know, with the Hindu tradition, ancient Hindu tradition, which is wrong. Because there is also an alternative tradition, very powerful, equally powerful philosophically, equally powerful morally and logically, you know, which we give up on entirely if we do this. So I want to finish now by saying that you know, the currently circulating arguments that suggest that the ideas at the basis of our constitution are colonial and therefore seriously faulty. And it is part of a larger, this thinking is part of a larger conception of our historical tradition, which I think is inadequate and misleading. Why inadequate? It inadequate it's inadequate because of what I said just now. It truncates the tradition. It selects some parts of the tradition and it obliviates other parts of the tradition, which to my mind are sometimes even more important. Tagore has a very powerful poem on the Buddha and uh, that actually shows a line of thinking which sees the tradition of ancient India you know, as being composed of various valuable uh, you know, lines of thought, one coming from the Upanishads, but also one coming very, very significant from the Buddha. But of course, his em emphasis on the Buddha is not as strong as Ambedkar's. It truncates the tradition. <coughs> and so what is available in Sanskrit is not just the world of Hinduism. The world of Sanskrit is not a Hindu world. The world of Sanskrit is a Hindu and a Buddhist world. And not merely Ambedkar, some of uh, you know, recent social scientists have also made that point. For instance, somebody I knew quite well, uh, D.R. Nagaraj, unfortunately died very young and uh, he didn't write very much except for that very short, very interesting book called, the, uh, I think, Flaming Feet. Um, Nagaraj made a point which was very similar. Secondly, I think it actually affects a transposition. It presents as colonial the most important themes of successful anti-colonial reflection. As I told you just now, that in my view, the neighborliness side of the Indian tradition of Indian political thought is the truly anti-colonial tradition. That is the tradition which defies the do intellectual dominance of the West. The other side of the tradition, you know, the blood side of the tradition, actually submits to the certitudes of Western political theory. So it's because of that, I think, and uh, it is a kind of sad, travestic inversion of what is the true picture of the tradition of Indian political thought. So I'm glad that we have been forced into a critical examination of our intellectual culture because of the recent uh, developments. But I don't see it going in a positive direction because of this. We are simply inventing new forms of intellectual subjection to the West, uh, subjection to the tarnished ideals of European modernity. Under the earlier regime of our intellectual culture, dominated by intellectually submissive Marxists and liberals, both, I think, equally submissive to the dominance of Western tradition, Attempts at breaking away from the dominance of European thought, except on the narrow political question of sovereignty, were feeble and faltering. Marxists were waiting for a capitalism of the Western kind to arrive to us in future, and 
unhelpfully designated the past as feudal, mischaracterizing both our past and our future. Right. Liberals simply recited the conditions under which democracy emerged and flourished in Europe and expected, in my view totally unreasonably, the same history to unfold here, here and to wait for it. Now I fear we are witnessing a more forceful phase of recolonization under a disguise. Hindu Rashtra is only the model of the European nation state, thinly and unconvincingly covered by, by a kind of flimsy wrapper of Indian tradition. It's particularly ironic that we are being told that we should emulate the European model of the modern state when the Western states themselves have recognized the folly and the pity of that mis misadventure and are trying, not always successfully, to find something which is more pluralistic, acknowledging the horrors that necessarily follow from that strange, tragic, and hubristic attempt to make all human beings identical and uniform, or to conquer the world for the use of only one community, as the West did in the period of colonialism. The logic of blood was based on the rejection of the logic of neighborliness. It's only when we can put this European illusion of the deadly mix of uniformity and domination behind that, to quote a uh, partly forgotten thinker, prehistory will end and human history will begin. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kaviraj. We have 28 minutes for discussion, out of which a few minutes will be for my colleague to propose a vote of thanks. So I'm willing and happy to identify the first questioner. Yourself, please. Yes. Yes, uh, you need a mic there, so. There may be more than just a few questions, so in the interest of time, Let's be as crisp and brief as possible with the question at the forefront, please. Uh, would you agree that the entire focus of your discourse, which is very, very right, of course, um, <clears throat> is based on Cartesian logic overlaid on Judeo-Christian ethics as a foundation of the critique you yourself are making? Obviously, I would not have said that if I believed that, but uh, it depends on what you mean by Cartesian logic. You know, if you mean by Cartesian logic, uh, you know, working with binaries and things like that, I understand that uh, I personally feel that, you know, binaries are illuminating, uh, essential, but at the same time, as the Buddhists, for instance, would say that use the binaries, but always remember that you have to modify the binaries when the time comes. So I'm always willing, you know, to uh, to modify this to, uh, you know, to uh, to be aware of greater complexities. But I think it's I thought that it's very important to make my point as sharply as possible. And I think in because I'm primarily a student of political theory, I find that this is one of the major distinctions in the lines of thought about the nation state. That's a line of blood and a line of thinking on neighborliness. Yes, please. Actually, I meant the person in front, but if you're going to get the mic faster, then I'll let you ask the question. Any more hands so that I get a sense of where to look? Yeah, hi. So I see one. Regarding two, your three, uh, uh, assertion about the rise of the idea of nation state in Europe, do you think it was uh, primarily because... Could you speak like, up a little bit? Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to like clarify, like, the fact that nation-state, idea of nation-state emerged in Europe, 
has it anything to, how sincere is that theory? Because it also coincides with the emergence of industrial revolution. Nation state and industrial revolution was kind of happened in the same historic time frame. And the structure of nation state helps the capitalists to invert the logic of violence and give a protection. That's the best conducive environment for industrial revolution to happen. So is it sincere theory or they're just covering up for capitalism? It's a good cover story for capitalism. And second is essentially why does a society like British who never had a written constitution want every colony to have a written constitution? You. The last one I think is an intriguing remark. I think uh, if you're a law student, it's your task to answer that question rather than mine. But anyway, um, no, uh, I should try to give a more serious uh, response to that. Um, you know, about the question of capitalism and the nation, you said that does it cover uh, capitalism? Depends on what you mean by cover. That, uh, you know, I personally feel that there's a connection between uh, the different constituent processes of modernity. I've also written about that. That what we call modernity is not a single process. It's a process which has a kind of um, contingent combination of uh, the economic process of transformation of economies from agricultural economies into industrial capitalist economies. A process of what the French, they have a better term for this, you know, a process that they would call etatisation, that is the statization of society, that giving over the disciplines of society more and more you know, to the control of the state. Individuation, social individuation, etc., bureaucratization, secularization. I call it, in my thinking about modernity, I feel that although you know, these processes have a kind of functional connection between them, when modernity matures and becomes a well-developed system, right, there is no sort of necessary, um, you know, there is no necessary sort of temporal synchronicity between them in the sense that it's not that all these things, uh, I've uh, given this example in one of my papers, it's not like the way in which the body of a child grows into the body of a man. So you have you know, two little eyes and a little nose, which actually becomes a fully grown eye and a nose, like that. It's something which happens in a much more complex, sequential kind of way. But I think the, the, the complex that we call modernity especially the complex of the political formation of modernity. The nation state is absolutely central to that in the European, uh, in the European context. But I agree with uh, Indian political thinkers that you know, we should not take that as the destiny of mankind. And we should not particularly, you know, in societies which are not like European, you know, homogenized European societies of the 19th and the 20th century, which are not like that. We should not simply pursue the illusion of the powerful modern state in order to make the society turn into something like that. Or the, the written constitution question I find very interesting, you know, because as a student of politics, um, I came across that very early when we started thinking about uh, constitutions. And uh, I'm also intrigued by that from a different point of view because I'm basically an intellectual historian and I think about the you know the destiny of text that something somebody writes something which for various reasons you know people uh, find to be extraordinarily important and they want to hold on to it but they have to hold on to it in the face of history you know, in the face of a time which is constantly pulling it into newer and newer circumstances. So one advantage could be that, you know, if you have a written constitution, then you have, in a certain sense, an illusion of fixity. And every 20 years or every 50 years, when your society undergoes a big transformation, then you have to come to a reckoning with that. The unwritten constitution has this advantage that you know, it is actually far more flexible and it avoids in some ways, you know, some of the difficulties which, which come up through the textualization of uh, the juridical spirit of, of a state. 
It's not a good answer to your question, but uh, I'm not qualified to answer it. Where's the mic? Okay, here in front, and then I will move to this side. Good evening, sir. My, uh, my question was related to the point that you made about uh, Hindu Rashtra as well as more European-like states. Uh, Yogendra Yadav in his uh, 2020 or 2021 book on elections in India phrased uh, the ascendancy of the Hindu nationalist parties as the coming of the Second Republic for India. Thomas Hansen makes the same point in his book, uh, The Majoritarian State, that for India to move towards that sort of a nation state, towards a Hindu Rashtra, it's not important that there be a clean break from the constitution. It is possible within the confines of the present constitution. So do you agree with that possibility? Do you see uh, uh, the country moving towards that sort of a nation state without there being a clean break from the constitution? I think so, because um, <coughs> you know this actually goes back to the question of textuality in a certain sense. Uh, there's a part of uh, a paper in which uh, I comment you know, on my own uh, bafflement, in a certain sense, about the constitutional moment of a society. On the one side, you know, the, it goes without saying that a constitution is a political document. All constitutions, starting from the French to our constitution, any constitution is, uh, is a political document in the sense that it is a re result of political processes and compromises uh, among different groups of people. The paradoxical thing is that once it's adopted as a constitution and it's actually turned and textualized into you know, this kind of stately language of law, right? Uh, you have to pretend that it is something which is developed from the ground in a purely sort of philosophical construction of, of legal principle. So I think it's a necessary, uh, necessarily paradoxical character of constitutions as a document. And I personally feel that you know it is because of this that I wrote a recent review of uh, I think a very interesting book by Madhav Khosla, who is my colleague at Columbia, uh, about the Indian uh, Indian Republic, particularly the foundational moment of the Indian Republic. My title is driven by this question. The title of my review is "Can a Constitution Defend Itself?" I think it's a very important question, uh, which they face in the United States as well, with the rise of Trump, that I think there is a kind of, there's an idea, which you can also, if you're critical of that, you can call it a conceit in liberal political thought, which thinks that uh, it can be put into common phrases like, you know, men as they are, and laws as they can be. So if you, if you devise laws, very skillfully, then in spite of all the perfections that you find in human beings, and also all the impulses that you find in sociological processes, you can hold on to a certain kind of proper juridical structure, right? This is, I think, one of the fundamental beliefs of liberal constitutionalism, right? But clearly, if we look at history, we find that that belief is actually put to the test from time to time. So I personally feel that, you know, uh, the Constitution, without turning the Constitution into something else, or without deeply modifying the constitutional structure, uh, the state can go in that direction. The country can go in that direction. Here at the front. Brief will be good. Sure, I'll do my best. Thank you so much for such a wonderful lecture. Uh, on the topic of constitution and election being in the air and 2024 coming in, why do you think the constitution did not have the words political party in its original format and was brought in only in the amendment to enable the anti-defection law? The anti-defection law itself is getting debated to further reducing democracy and independence. 
So, and the constitution bench is evaluating it. So why do you think, did they accidentally forgot the word politic, you know, political party or what was the thinking behind it? That's a good question. Uh, I think it's a very difficult question for me because I think you need somebody who's a lawyer and uh, has much greater understanding of legal history to uh, do that. All that I can do from my side, you know, as a student of political history and political theory, is that uh, you know this is something which I should have probably said in my initial remarks that uh, you know the making of the constitution consists of two different types of intellectual construction. Now, one side of intellectual construction essentially consists of political theoretical ideas. It's the kind of things that I mentioned today that uh, we are going to create a state, and it's very conventional in the modern world to think of the state as typically the European nation state, right? Uh, are we going to do that? Or are we trying to create a state which is different from the European nation state? So these are the political theory ideas which drive the making of something like a constitution. But on the other side, I'm acutely conscious that the constitution is also a legal document. And it has to be fashioned legally by people who are skilled lawyers. And so obviously the constitution, making of the constitution has two sides in my view. One is this political theory side, and the other one is the juridical side where these people who are highly skilled uh, lawyers, they looked around constitutions in the whole world, particularly in the Western world, and they took up whatever they thought was useful for their context. And I think if you look at the generally influential constitutions in the Western world, it can be for two reasons. You know, one is that putting the word political party into a constitution would create problems of various kinds juridically. But my suspicion is, if you think of the American constitution, right, and if you re read the Federalist Papers, which constantly discusses the sociology of constitution making in America, you'll see that Madison particularly is very worried about uh, what he calls factions, you know, uh, interest aggregations, factions. But he does not use the term political party because party during his time in his, the language of his historical period would simply mean a clutch of people who have some kind of common interest. So I think because they modeled it to some extent on these canonical constitutions, and most of the canonical constitutions were written before the rise of the modern political party system, which you can trace only to the middle of the 19th century. I think it's probably historically because of that, that it doesn't occur there. But it's a historian's answer, you know, it's not a lawyer's answer. I actually have two questions that I'd like to ask sure. now, please. One is about the, can you elaborate a bit the shift in your own thinking about Tagore on the question of disenchantment? And the second is a request for an illustration that can tell us something about how the how, how the originality of Indian political thought is part of the genealogy of the Constitution. I think it's effective to understand that the makers of the Constitution are amongst those you discussed while telling us the ways in which the parampara way of looking at political community differed from the more conventional Western European model. So if there's time for the example, then that would be helpful if there is an illustration. And the first is the question on just restating and elaborating a bit the Tagore point on enchantment and disenchantment. How does he differ from Weber? And how did you see him as first agreeing and then disagreeing? You know, I, uh, I think I try to present rather cryptically what I see as a kind of outline of a philosophical argument in Tagore. And as I said, the argument goes to the heart of this uh, thing because anybody who is a serious uh, theologian working uh, under modern conditions, they must face this question. If you look at one of the remarkable books about the question of religion and modernity in the last few years, uh, Charles Taylor's uh, The Secular Age, I think it also places that um, question at the center. I must say, parenthetically, that you know, Taylor is, of course, uh, one of the Anglo-American uh, political theorists who is very, very deeply learned in the German tradition. And I was very surprised that you know, in the entire book, uh, The Secular Age, uh, 
there's not a single mention of Bultmann. No, but I find Bultmann, I, I find, you know, thinking by three students of Heidegger <clears throat> in somewhat different but adjacent fields, very, very powerful. You know, one is Gadamer, his elaboration of the condition of historicity, what does it mean for something to be historical? Uh, the second is uh, Koselek, who thinks about you know, what is uh, history, but in a slightly different form. And the third one I consider very important is Bultmann. And his question is that, that you know, if we, uh, we have two possibilities, or three possibilities. One possibility is that um, we say that we believe in God, and we do not accept uh, modern science, at least fully. And we rearrange the picture that modern science gives us in a way that we can actually keep a place to put God inside that without uh, inconsistency, right? The second position would be that no, we believe in the picture of modern science and as uh, to use Taylor's uh, uh, language, uh, belief in modern science means disenchantment. We simply cannot believe in God and all that follows from there. And then you can have a middle position, at least as a question, which I think is the question of Bultmann. And Taylor also comes to that kind of conclusion later on. He says that uh, it doesn't follow necessarily that if you take the imminent view of the world, you know, which is the picture that science gives us of the world, you must necessarily believe that it's impossible to believe in God, right? So I think the question, uh, what struck me was the centrality of the question in thinking about the place of religion and in modernity. And I thought that what Tagore was doing was to, as I said, initially I felt that Tagore was actually accepting the process of disenchantment and then saying that we should do something to trump the process of disenchantment throughout. Which is actually, I think that is a that's a position which is much more common among modern thinkers. I think there are lots of thinkers who are non-religious thinkers who would take that position, that we need something you know, which enchants the world in a certain sense. And we cannot do that by religion, we can do that by art. And that also goes to the argument sometimes that you know, art does for modern society what religion did for uh, pre-modern ones. But I th thinking about it more closely, and I think one interesting thing is that, you know, uh, if you hear something in music, I've written about that in a Bengali book. Uh, if you listen to something in music, it's not a propositional presentation of the ideas to you. You know, if I read the same sentences in Tagore as a poem, I think it has a kind of linear progression. It starts with a particular sentence, it goes into every single sentence. No, sen no sentence is repeated, right? And then I come to the last sentence and the poem finishes. Or you can say that the poem does not peter out, the poem stops. I think the difference between hearing those words in, in a poetic form or reading in a, in a page of a book and listening to it in music, which I do uh, all the time for various reasons, uh, I think the words and the ideas come to you in a very different types of address, you know, because of the repetition in music. Uh, and in a certain sense, when the music finishes, it does not finish quite like a poem. You know, actually, there's always a possibility that you will hear that music again. And uh, so particularly if there are questions which are central to a musical composition. You know, there's a kind of endlessness to the asking of the question, that you know, you come back to it, and even within the music itself, it comes back cyclically. And the more I thought about it, I felt that his position was a position which was different from all these well-known positions. And the position essentially is that I accept as, and this is the, for instance, secret of the friendship between Tagore and Einstein. So he has actually deep uh, respect for people who are the great scientists of the world because he sees science as something which is a great acquisition of humanity. And he never, uh, you know, means his words about this. He's very categorical and clear about it. 
but he also feels, I think it's a very simple but very powerful idea, that the more science actually shows me the intricacy of the universe, the more I feel uh, enchanted in this sense. You know, because it also has an aesthetic uh, wonder. And the scientific wonder and the aesthetic wonder, the basic point I wanted to make was very simple, that in the Weberian argument, there's an inverse relationship between the scientific wonder and the aesthetic wonder. Basically what Weber is saying, if you put it in my language, that the more you satisfy, in a certain sense, the uh, cognitive wonder, the aesthetic wonder is bound to diminish. In his case, he does not actually see why that should happen. That the more the universe is presented to us as intricate, infinite, complex, etc., you know, your understanding of I think there there are passages in European thinkers also, which sometimes touches on something like this. You know, there's a passage in Kant, famous passage in Kant, and others, and also in people like Heidegger. But I think he captures something which seemed to me to be very striking, and which, is, which also has the character, surprisingly, you know, of a very, very sharp and closed argument, you know, which we do not expect from somebody who we read essentially as a poet. So that is also something that I implied in my lecture, that you know, the innovativeness, uh, the, my question is not whether Indian thought is innovative or not. Uh, I think the more I read it, I think, not, of course, not everything, but lots and lots of very, very interesting, uh, you know, innovative thoughts in Indian thinking. So my question actually becomes, why is it that we do not see them as innovative? You know, that seems to me to be an interesting question. And I have two answers to that, preliminarily. Uh, if I think about it more, I probably would be able to give you more answers. The first answer is, our habituation to this idea that you know all original thinking or all serious thinking comes from Europe. And therefore, when we read our thinkers, we read negligently. You know, because reading is a very complex activity. And nowadays, because I teach theories of reading, uh, we cover all kinds of uh, aspects of reading. And I think one of the most interesting parts of reading is um, not your comportment, but the expectations with which you go into reading. You know, in Indian thought, sometimes you know there is a very interesting concept used in slightly different inflections in different philosophical traditions. You know, which is vasana, uh, what you expect when you uh, get into something, when you read something, and that conditions to some extent what you find. Right. So you find, in a certain sense, not in a mysterious sense, but you find something that you were looking for. Uh, for instance, when I uh, I was talking to Sharmuli today when we were coming uh, here, that we were talking about Tagore play, which she has used, I think, very nicely in her paper. And uh, she asked me, what do you think of that play? And I was telling her, which is an instance of this uh, thing, that, uh, of course, I'm a very avid reader of Tagore. I've read Tagore many times. I've read that play with great admiration. But the interesting thing is that the question that she had when she went to that play. I never read that play with that question in my mind, right? So therefore, you know, I, I have not thought about those things in, with regard to that play. So I personally feel that something like that happens when we read our thinkers, we read negligently, negligently in a subtle sense, negligently not in the sense that we're not paying attention. We are paying attention. But we do not expect to be startled by something which is a big uh, new idea, right? So that is one thing. And the other thing, of course, I think is a, is a complex question. Professor Kaviraj, I have to do something quite rude now, which is we to have say to that we're running now. out of time. That's fine. So, Shalmoli, you will have one minute okay. after Professor Kaviraj finishes this sentence and the few That's sentences fine. after. Sorry. Okay. Finish the sentence. No, I, I meant that the other thing is the question of the form of writing. It's a question of genre. That I'm reading something which is, uh, which is a poem, or I'm listening to something which is a song. And it's a task for us to, if we are stopped by that, and if we feel that there's an argument there, it's our task to uh, extract it 
from that and present it in the form of an argument. If we do, then of course that would start having currency and it would come into the general discourse of political theory. Thank you. Shalmoli, please propose a vote of thanks. As faculty member of the NLSIU, affiliated to the MK Nambiar Chair on Constitutional Law, I express my heartfelt thanks to Professor Sudipta Kaviraj for this exhilarating lecture um, and also for speaking to us on a topic that is so timely and important. Thanks to the audience for being here and for enriching the discussion. I had thought of adding a small biographical note. Uh, I'll be very brief. Um, 10 years back when I was an undergraduate student in law, I felt a sense of dissonance between legal scholarship and the scholarship in humanities. In Indian history and political thought, the question of originality was being invoked by Professor Kaviraj, but also other scholars that he mentioned uh, and richly engaged with. Whereas um, in law scholarship, although you know, excellent strides were being made in doctrinal studies, I think relatively less attention was being paid to legal theory. Um, and I must also quickly add that even political theorists who wrote extensively about the originality of political and cultural ideas in Indian thinking uh, conceded that perhaps largely the discourse on law and statecraft in India is derivative. Which is why I think, I mean, this is how I perceive the importance of today's lecture. The way Professor Kaviraj brought law and the political together and how political thought theory can enrich legal thinking. I think this is really the, um, the lesson that, if I may, the lesson that we can carry with us and take upon the task of theorizing about law in our own way. Thank you. <laughs>